everybody, we're so glad you made it. I, let me just invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to get our praise on this morning because he lives. Amen. Amen. Here we go. Yeah. 
right, good morning, good morning, Proximity Church. How you guys doing? Awesome, awesome. Welcome those of you that are watching online as well. My name is Travis, and this is my beautiful wife, Joanne. Um, we're a couple of the pastors here, um, but I just want to welcome you to Proximity Church. We really desire uh, to be a place where you truthfully experience uh, God and all that he is and all of his love, uh, the community that he has for us and the purpose that he has designed you for. And so um, if it's your first time here, we just hope that you experience him in a new way and experience uh, the love from his community here today. And if it is your first time or it's been a while and you don't remember where everything is, uh, we do have a cafe that you saw on your way in. It is not just for when you walk in. So if you need a drink of water or a snack or anything, feel free to make yourself at home and you can bring it to your uh, chair. We also have a visitor station that we would love to meet you at the end and be able to give you a gift. If you need to use the restrooms, they're over here to the back. And if you have a little one, we have a mommy and me. So if they get restless or crying or you need a diaper changing station, we have a mommy and me room by the front door. And also we have an area for preschoolers and elementary age um, in, uh, outside. So you'll go around and you'll see the wiggle men. Uh, so if you didn't get a chance to drop them off, we would love to be able to do some crafts and share with them in an age appropriate uh, format what we're celebrating today. And so Travis is gonna share a little bit of what to expect in today's service. Yes, yeah, so here today, um, just kind of give you a heads up of what we do. Um, and so here in a minute, we're going to continue uh, what we, um, the time of song and praise and, and worshiping our God. We're so grateful for the life that he's given us and the, and the things that he just continues to show us and the community that he's placed us in and the purpose that he has just filled us with. And so we we worship and we glorify God for all of that and for the life that he's given us, the breath that he's given us. And so we're going to enter into some more time of worship. Um, after that, we are going to have um, our lead pastors be coming up and they're going to be giving a sermon. And we're also going to be having communion uh, later today as well. And this is just a really a representation of everything that God has done for us. And, and we'll go into what that means a little bit more. Um, and then we'll have a time of prayer um, to really just support one another. We all are at different places in our faith journey. And all of us live life outside of Sundays. And so we want to be here as a family to support you and whatever you're going through and be there for you through that process. And so we're going to have some time of prayer. And then at the end, we'll have some announcements and we'll just kind of go through what we do afterwards and what we're going to do with the kids, all that kind of stuff. But I'll save that for later. But let's go ahead and pray as we get in and just really expect God to move in you personally. God, just thank you for this opportunity to meet like this. That today, we take the time to slow down our busy lives and just really, really hone in on who you are, God. That you sent your son, Jesus Christ, for each and one, every one of us. And we're thankful for everything that you've done. Not only did you send Jesus to bridge that gap so we could be in right standing with you and have this relationship with you, but that you've also given us this amazing helper of the Holy Spirit. And so God, we pray that you open our minds, soften our hearts here today. That all the distractions begin to float away and that we could place every stress, every circumstance, every need, every praise report, that we can place those things back at your feet, God, and trust you fully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Enjoy.
this story of, of the creation of the world back in Genesis and it, it was such a sweet reminder of what we've been redeemed of. We see the introduction of sin into the world in the book of Genesis, right? But in Genesis 3.15, we see the first, um, the first time, the first mention in Scripture about God's promise for Jesus to come redeem what had happened when sin entered the world. When sin entered the world, our relationship with Him was hindered and our worship was distorted but i want to encourage you this morning maybe you walked into this place and you're living in that sin maybe you haven't realized that there's been a savior that's been sent so that your worship can be restored so that your relationship with him can be mended again and so i want to ask you this morning before we keep this time of worship going how has your sin how has sin in general changed your worship because the good news this morning is that everything has been restored through Jesus Christ. And so you can have access. Maybe sin takes away and closes the door and acts to access his presence. But I want to remind you this morning that we have access to his presence through Jesus Christ. That you no longer have to be bound by that sin. And so God, we come together this morning as a body of believers and we remind each other of that we remind each other that we don't have to walk in that anymore that those chains have been broken that maybe Adam and Eve had to cover themselves in leaves ashamed of their sin ashamed realizing that they were naked but that this morning God we have a better covering we have the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ so that we can come before you with boldness that we can realize that we've been forgiven whether we know it or not we've been forgiven and so would you remind us this morning of that as we continue to worship you May every word that comes out of our lips be genuine and true. As your word says, that our worship would be in spirit and in truth. That it would be real, that it would be authentic. May you be glorified this morning, God. You're so good. So good. us apart who has called us by name worshiping gratitude of that ultimate sacrifice of love amen
worship today. Family, lift up your hands right where you are or put your hand on your heart. Would you honor me this morning with that? Just put your hand on your heart or lift up your hands to the Lord. Everybody in unison, in one accord together. Lord, we honor you this morning. A room of imperfect people with many flaws, many shortcomings, but bent and determined to give you honor and praise. This morning, God, we give you a sacrifice of praise in spite of what we feel and in spite of what we're thinking, in spite of what's going on in our hearts and minds today. We lift your name. You said if you be lifted high, you would draw men to you, Lord. So this morning, be lifted high. High above every problem, every situation. But name above all names. Above cancer and lack and illness and disease your name above poverty your name above trouble your name above our name we humbly bow god the disposition disposition of our heart this morning we say let thy kingdom come and thy will be done father if we know that there is areas and seasons and days and moments where we fall short and you gently remind us that in, your, in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. That you're all the while at work in us both to will and to do your good, good pleasure. That you're working all things together for our good. Even in moments of hardship and difficulty, you could be trusted. Father Mary, we never lose the awe of who you are, creator of heaven and on earth, name above all name, and king above all kings, and ruler of all, creator of all. This morning we stand in awe. I stand. Come on, let's sing it one more time together. Come on, even if you can't sing, sing it out. Of your faithfulness, of your love and kindness. Come on, one more time together. Of your goodness and your faithfulness. We worship you today. You've been good. You've been good. You've been good. You've been good. Love you. We worship you today. Heavenly Father, as we worship you with the reading of your word, as we worship you, as we commune with one another, have your way, we pray today. Would you do something in our hearts today? Minister to our kids, our young people, and all those all over the world who gather in your name today. Refresh and renew, restore. May we fall in love with you again today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise today. Annalena, would you come? Would you turn around, say hello to one another, greet each other? The goal is 10 people today. Would you say hi to 10 people? I'm going to switch mics. Would you say hi to 10 people? Hallelujah. I'll hold since I have, I have a cord, a hand. Yeah, I'll trade you. Here we go, baby. Yes. <laughs> How do you know? You have to have your ticket. You got to have your ticket. Hopefully you got a ticket. Glory. Well, good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. How are you? Thumbs up, sideways down. We're, after worship, I'm feeling great. Glory. A little lighter. Awesome. <laughs> well, uh, we are going to do a raffle. Some of you are like, I didn't get a ticket. I see your lips. I didn't get a ticket. So we have Eliana. 
right, Eliana? Yes. We we recruited the pregnant lady <laughs> to get her steps in. So yeah, she's going to walk. Woo. It might so come yes, early. If someone wants to help the pregnant lady out, you can. But if you did not get a raffle ticket, please raise your hand, and she'll make sure to get you one. We all like Glory. free things, right? Yes. I'm excited. <laughs> so fun. What are we going to start? We're going to start off with one of these books. You can start. We have books, so if you don't read, this is your day. If you this don't read, give day. it away. Don't let it collect dust, okay? Yes. All right. Yes. We're going to start with Crazy Love by Francis Chan. How about Ooh, that? Oh, that's a good one. It's classic. That's a good one. This is the one that you, um, I, ha I have travel pack of tissues. Yes. Take those with you because really, oh, hands are up on this section. We're ready. So we, we got to get we going over here. Yes. We'll wait. But this is a great book. How many of you read Crazy Love, audio, audio booked it, yeah. whatever you do? Yes. Revisit YouTube. This one. <laughs> if you watch, Francis Chan actually has some YouTube um, All right, let's do this. Things to go. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm trying to oh, like okay. take Stall. time so that we can, yeah, get them in there. But we're glad that you joined us today. Yes. It's going to be a great day. Amen. We have some great right. things planned. How many of you, by raise of hands, have ever had a, is it Wesley Chip? Oh. <laughs> Wesley Chip cookie in your life. In your life. And you will today. Yes. We will do worship over again and thank <laughs> the Lord above for Wesley Chip cookies once you have one. Because they change your life. Yes. And Carla made them. They look beautiful. Yes. And so stay after service because we are giving, you get a cookie and you get a cookie. <laughs> Everyone gets a cookie. All right, let's do this. Okay. I'm ready. If you don't, don't have your ticket, I'm sorry. I don't have any tickets. We're waiting oh. on the baskets. So oh, who's whenever, got the basket? Lewis does. Come on, Lewis. He's, he's waiting. He's just a, bring me the he's basket. He's an includer. He wants everyone to participate. If you do a couple, you no just troll. bring him what up and it? throw no him in. No troll left behind. All right, babe. Here we go. Okay. You, you do tell it. I have kids. Okay, here <laughs> we right, go. here we go. Okay, are we whooping it? Okay, we so. We can whoop. Whoop. That's the sound. <laughs> what is that, Quincy? See? Whoop. Okay. Whoop. Whatever one is yours. Whoop every time you hear a number. Ready? Uh-oh. Three. Oh. Oh, oh you wait. Catch up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's the singer. <laughs> Seven. Three. Yeah. Five. Yeah. Five. Uh-oh. Six. Hey, oh, come get you. Happy birthday. It's her, it was her birthday this week, so that was perfect. Yeah, let's give it happy up for Crystal. Happy birthday, Crystal. Good Crystal job. is one of our worship leaders. We love her and her yes, family. Congratulations. Awesome. Yay. Are yes. we doing another book? We're doing another one of these? One more book. Okay, one, one more book. book. One more book. And one then we'll book. do one. Uh, one of these. Okay, okay, deal. Here we go. You, you want to switch up the book? Yeah. Uh, no, let's no, keep it. Let's okay, keep it. Okay. I, I like this side. Okay. All right, here we go. Here we go. Whoop. Whoop. Here we go. Three. Woo! Seven. Woo! Three. Woo! Five. Woo! Five. Woo! This side. This side. Two. Yes! Hey! We're, come Ruth, on, you Ruth. win every time. Every She's time got we a have gift. a gift. Okay, become hey man, friends go, with Ruth. That's go give me I one say. of those Powerball tickets. Would you yes. play one of those? Bring me yeah. one of those. Yeah, this is better. I'm not. It works if somebody else plays and gives it to you. Yeah, no, you know yeah. what I'm saying. Okay, okay, I'm teasing. One more gift. One, one of these? Yeah. Okay. okay. If Here you, we go. Go ahead. You tell them. You want me to explain what these are? Yeah, because it's just okay, so pretty. Okay, so this is something that we do with our kids every Holy Week. So every day, or depends how you do it. It doesn't do it matter. Yourself. But it's, it's a way to remember Holy Week by yourself or with your family. Yes. It's but, pretty cool. Yes. And some of you have them because yes. we've gifted them before. But here we go. If you have this, give it away, okay? Three. Got a boy and a girl one. Seven. Three. I think these are all the same. <laughs> Five. Okay, Gets everybody excited. Zero. Okay. Okay. This side. This side, maybe. Eight. <laughs> three, seven, three, five, zero, eight. Are you sure it's not a nine? Eight? It could be because, you know, Let I am see. getting in my No, no that's, that's an eight. eight. Okay. okay. We're moving on. Nine! Yay! Hey. <laughs> Charlie, God bless you, girl. Enjoy that with David. Hey, hey, no one said we had to play by the rules, right? Right. John, would awesome. you take that for me or Angela? Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Well, we just wanted to take a moment and say welcome. Who won? Who actually won? Oh, we got you, girl. We'll no, get come you on. One. We, give yeah, me come the get other it, one. Come get it. We have another one. Come, come Deanna. Get it. Let's give it up for Deanna. Deanna. She was in the mommy and me room, and she was like, nope, I'm getting one she, of these. She threw her kid. She's like, got to go. Hey, mama of three little ones. Boys. Let's give it up for Deanna. 
She needs some resurrection eggs in her life. Yes. So we sure. just <laughs> we just wanted to say thank you for your faithfulness, uh, for coming out today. Those of you watching online, good morning. Um, we're excited for what the Lord is going to do today. And we just wanted to make sure we introduce ourselves. I'm Javier. Oh, I'm Angelina. If you didn't know. We probably should have done that at the beginning. But whatever. Yes. This is family. And so we hope that something you hear today or something that is said or an interaction that you have uh, tugs at your heart and brings you a little bit closer to Jesus. That's all we want from you. If you came to hear me speak, you're going to be disappointed. But if you came to hear from the Lord, I am trusting that he will speak to you today. Awesome. Amen. Yes, yes. We're getting ready to watch this video and then I'll come back and we'll jump right in. Awesome. All right. are situated and ready to go. Good morning. Again, thank you for joining us. I want to jump right in uh, and I want, uh, if the guys in the back would put this picture up, would you put the first picture up? This is the most reproduced image of Jesus in all of human history, all right? It's a 1941 uh, oil painting uh, by Warren Salmon, more than 500 million copies reproduced, like calendars and bumpers. No, I don't know bumper stickers, but you know what I'm saying. Like all kinds. People have these in their homes. People have these as bookmarks. People have these in their car to keep their car from getting stolen. You know how people could be. They got all, bless my house, bless my car, tattooed on your shoulder. I don't know, but this is the most reproduced picture of Jesus. It's a very simple image with not so simple implications. Every image has a story underneath it. The reality is that there's, there are unexamined assumptions that we all cling to. This image shapes how you think about Jesus. Perhaps in more ways than you and I realize, there is one outstanding or a few outstanding features, obviously, Jesus in this picture is a white European male with blue eyes and long, long, long hair, impeccable hair. I'm jealous. <laughs> Jesus got blue eyes in this picture. Handsome, man. You know, I can say that. I'm talking about Jesus. Leave me alone. But this is a picture that you could find in somebody's office. Or if you go to somebody's house, you might find this picture hanging up if they are, you know, overtly, you know, loving of Jesus. In 2002, however, a group of uh, British New Testament scholars partnered up with some forensic scientists. And they toured all over Jerusalem. They got access to skeletons and skulls found in tombs all around Jerusalem where Jesus hung, dating to the times of Jesus. And they did this 3D skull images. And they wanted to get as accurate of a res representation of what Jesus would actually look like um, aside from this representation that the entire world has come to know and to love. At least a closer idea to the face of Jesus. And here's the image, if you put it up for me. Now, I'm not saying that this is Jesus, but the odds are that this is a more accurate representation of what Jesus may have actually looked like. The average male skeleton of a Jewish man was about five, six, no blue eyes, right? Of course, black hair, a much larger 
nose. Is there a way to put these side by side? Okay, put that up. If you're honest, perhaps one of these pictures makes you feel more comfortable than the other pictures. And I want you to feel that for a second. Feel that. Ask yourself why perhaps you lean towards one and not the other. Why would more people prefer the, least, the, the less accurate version of Jesus? Is it more palpable? What's going on here? It raises this kind of age-old question about how we perceive things and how we perceive and how we perceive things drives our assumptions and shapes the way we see the world. There are many people, at least 500 million, that think that the picture on your left is the accurate representation of Jesus. And they prefer that perhaps over the truth. Similarly, if I ask you the question, who is Jesus, you likely give me an answer based on a few things. How you grew up, what movies <laughs> you watch or TV shows you watched, right? If you watch a Jesus film, Jesus looks like that, right? Whatever your kid's pastor or youth pastor told you growing up about Jesus, that's how you see Jesus. That's the image of Jesus that you have. Whatever culture perhaps has demonstrated to you, whatever images or pictures or characteristics of Jesus um, you have in your mind and heart, that's how you see Jesus. What you heard or saw on a reel or on a short, perhaps based on what little Bible perhaps that you read, not trying to insult you, but the majority of people don't read their Bibles, just keeping it real with y'all this morning, right? There's some statistics that are pretty astounding. Just over one-third of U.S. adults, according to this Barna study, 34% read their Bible once a week. Once a week. That hurts. While 50% read the Bible less than twice a year, including never. That's a lot of non-Bible reading for people who believe that Jesus is their Lord and King. A lot of us are celebrating him today. Maybe you find yourself in that category, not trying to judge you or anything. Just reality of facts. We, we do other things. Other things that we deem important, other things that are important, right? I'm not discrediting you having to go to work, raise your children, do the things you have to do. By no means, I'm there, I'm with you. Got three of my own, work a full-time job, and I'm here with you today, right? We've all adopted a picture of who Jesus is, of what he would and would not do, of what Jesus would and would not say, of what Jesus, uh, who Jesus was or who Jesus wasn't based on how you grew up, what you were given, what you received as a child. If you are a young person here, your view of Jesus is being shaped what I'm while, uh, because of what I'm talking to you about this morning. You're getting a picture of who Jesus is, which you will likely, hopefully, pass on to your children, Right? We have a picture of who he was and who he's not. Perhaps the picture of Jesus is different than the reality that we see in the Bible. Maybe the picture that you have of Jesus is different than what the Bible teaches Jesus is like. Look like, that's not really what I'm talking about here, but you're following me, right? You're picking up what I'm putting down this morning. So it's not just about what Jesus looked like physically, but who he is. If you even say who he was, then you'd be mistaken in your depiction of who Jesus is is because Jesus is not, is not was, right? But if, if you talk about it in Jesus was terms and you're missing the reality that Jesus is, that's another sermon for another day. Pastor Travis could do that one. But perhaps the picture of Jesus you have, not to insult you, but looks more like this. Maybe this picture. Maybe that's the picture, like not the face that you see when you think of Jesus, but how you relate or associate to Jesus. Perhaps he is a genie in a lamp for you, and when you, when you rub him the right way, you get, you get your wishes, and you're like, poof, what do you need? And Jesus comes up when you need a poof, what do you need? And Jesus comes to you, poof, what do you need? Maybe, maybe that's how you see him. Again, not a knock, just trying to get us all on the same page. I love you. I'm not trying to diss you, right? Or maybe, maybe you see Jesus like this, maybe like a slot machine, like, man, I'll put my tithe in, I'll put my offering in, and I'm just going to, and just hope, because, like, maybe you, you interact with Jesus, you just believe that it's maybe, maybe he'll answer my prayer, like, what surety do I have that he's going to answer my prayer, like, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, I don't know. But maybe this is how you relate to Jesus. Maybe this is the picture that you have. And maybe not, it's not a spoken picture, one you'd care to share with everybody else, this is how I see Jesus, but in your life, in your actions, in the way you do life, this is how you 
engage with God. This is how you engage with Jesus. It's like if he was a slot machine and I'm just going to try my luck today to see if I get my prayer answered. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the house and I'm going to pray just in case. I ain't trying to get in no accident today. Or just in case I'm eating somewhere different and the food is poison, I'm going to pray that my, my food is not poison. I won't get a tummy ache. And, uh. Or my children are going to school for the first time. Or let me tell God, cover, p- cover them, please, because those are my babies. You got to take care of them. So I hope you take care of them. Or I'm about to get married. I hope we make it more than a year. I hope we make it. And that's how you interact with the Lord. There's some other examples, and I didn't want to, and I didn't want to put a bunch of pictures up. But maybe as a Santa Claus, who comes once a year and gives you the gifts that you want because somebody told you that God gives you the desires of your heart, but didn't give you no context of what that meant. So you grew up believing that God is like Santa; He's gonna bring you everything you want. But if you had a bad experience with Santa, then and you were let down by Santa, then you translate that to God. I'm not gonna talk about that today either. But maybe you see Jesus, your image, how you interact with him. It's like a parent with a belt, right? Maybe you, not a belt, maybe a chancleta. Anybody got thrown one, received one, you know? Parents could be, I don't know. I mean, I ain't never thrown one. Maybe I need to start practicing. Maybe it's a mom thing. Who knows? You know, this one's a little more uh, difficult to say, but I'm going to say it all adults, young people here in our midst. But maybe the way you interact with Jesus is like a man would it, interact with a prostitute and we don't like to hear that but perhaps that's how you interact and what I mean by that is you know you go see a prostitute when you have a need that needs to be met but that's the only time you go and so you pay to have your needs met and you don't talk to this woman or male any other time except when you need something that's a harsh reality that we all at some point or not have treated our king only, I'm only intimate when I need something. I'm only going to see you when there's something. I don't know, that hurts. I, he, it hurts me saying, so I, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not trying to, but you hear my heart, I'm trying to get us all on the same page. But this is perhaps the reason that Jesus has so many admirers. Maybe that's the reason, that because he's perceived as a genie or as a Santa Claus or as a place you could go to get the, the stuff you, you need if you, if you do it right. Maybe if you pray right. Maybe if you come to church enough or behave enough or don't cuss enough or don't drink enough. And then I, that, that's your money to see if the wheel and if I could get what I need. And maybe that's the reason Jesus has many admirers but very few followers. Because there's a difference between being an admirer of Jesus from a distance. I admire, I respect, I honor the Bible. I, I want that for my kids. I don't know how much I want it for me, but I want it for my kids. It's good values. You know what I'm saying? That's one of the reasons I go to church is so that my kids would grow up with these values and these things. I want them to be honest. I want them to be hardworking. I want them to be blessed by God if that's the thing. I want that for them. So I'll go to church because I want that for my kids. But this is, this is not... Uh, other people's thing today is a you thing. It's an individual thing. I mean, we don't, we don't access or have relationship to God uh, intimately through other people. This is a one-on-one thing. This is for you and you. Your children will have to make the decisions for themselves. Do I suggest that you, yes, present, show, demonstrate, of course. But Jesus has many admirers. Like you would admire a celebrity. Like you would admire a singer or an artist that you like. You admire what they do. You might like their picture. You might share their music. You might have a shirt with their picture on it or their concert tour on it because you admire. And they might use profanity and cuss and undermine all the values that you stand for, but you'll listen to it and you'll share it because you admire what they do, maybe. Maybe admire is the wrong word, but people... Admire Jesus all over the place. But Jesus hasn't called us to be admirers. He's called us to be followers. He's called us to be followers. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm sure you have a reason. If you're an admirer only, or perhaps you've, what's the word? Not downgraded, that sounds bad. But maybe you've just, your posture of life has taken you to the place that you've gone from a follower to perhaps an admirer now in this season of your life. Um. If I gave you the microphone today and asked you to tell us a story of why you've placed your life there, why you're living from that vantage point, I'm sure you have a good reason and the majority of us would be like, I understand. 
You lost your job. You went bankrupt. Your child died. Your parent died. You got cancer. You prayed. It didn't get answered. So here I am, right? My parents' faith, I don't really believe, but I'm here. So kind of, you know, just get this over with. I don't know what got you. And I'm sure you tell me the story. Maybe somebody hurt you that was supposed to take care of you. Maybe you were shamed. Church hurt. People like me in places like this with microphones on that said something that offended you, that hurt you. I'm sorry for that. I can't do anything about that. Just love you through it. Talk you through it, perhaps. But I certainly wouldn't judge you for where you are in life. But if I had the opportunity to sit down with you and tell you why I think you should reconsider, i will give you a few reasons why I think you should reconsider becoming a follower. And not just an admirer. Jesus has enough admirers, but that's not what he wanted to make. And so while that's a good first step, is that's all it is, is a first step. And I'd lie to you if I told you that that's the whole journey, just to be an admirer from a distance. No, that's cheating yourself for what could ultimately be the best relationship of your life. Because you can enjoy from a distance some of the benefits, but I... But I'd be lying, disingenuous if I told you that that's all it is and I just want you to admire and wear the t-shirt. I wouldn't try, if I'm trying to, 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 to persuade you or, or encourage you to look at Jesus again, I wouldn't start by looking at church history. Church history has had moments, seasons, and years of foolishness. So I wouldn't try to excuse that. People are flawed, fam. Wherever you go, you're in this church, flawed church, because you're in it, I'm in it. Just welcome to the club. It just is what it is. Right? So if you're looking for the perfect church, everywhere you go, I'm perfect now. Right? Everywhere I go, same thing. I wouldn't try to defend the way Christians have treated you, your family, or your friends because sometimes Christian people do dumb things in the name of Jesus. They say things that are dumb. They love wrong. They forgive wrong. They judge wrong. I wouldn't try to defend some of the values that some people that call themselves Christians which really are just admirers, right? But, but, but they're classified in the Christian group. So now you, you see one that acts crazy and you believe we all act crazy. You see a pastor that steals. You believe all steals. You see pastors that, that say something and then live something else and you assume all pastors do that. So I'm sorry. I wouldn't try to convince you with the way people act because people are crazy. I can't control people. I, listen, fam, anybody got children? Raise your hand. You, raise your hand if you have children. Ask yourself the question, can you control your children? No. You, I mean, when they're small, it's easy. Put them in a playpen, controlled. But if they want to poop their diaper, they don't care what you say. And they're not going to do anything about it but wait for you. Some of them play with it, and that's disgusting. No, don't act like you. Come on now. We've all had poop in our hands from kids if you're a parent. It's nasty, but it's just a fact. And if you don't have your children, your mama had your poop in her hands. Or dad. Or other places. And I wouldn't try to convince you, if I was sitting with you, I wouldn't try to convince you with the Bible. And I wouldn't try to convince you with the Bible because I wouldn't just say the Bible says, right? I wouldn't just say, I, w- I would focus you on an event. And that's the event we gather here to celebrate today. And the, and the event that the world celebrates is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what I would point you to if I was asking you to take the faith seriously. If I was coming up to you and say, hey, listen, you're not a baby no more. At some point, you're going to have to see if this is for you or not for you. Don't worry about nothing else. What people say, what people don't say, the example other people gave you, what your mama said, that's all sidebar. You're going to have to decide who is Jesus, and I'm going to point you at an event. That's all I'm going to do, point you at an event, the resurrection of Jesus. Because the reason I will point you to that is because Jesus' followers believe Jesus rose from the dead many years before there was a Bible. So before this book was put together that your parents lived by, that now they're trying to hand you, that they never read, but they're hoping that you read it. I ain't trying to diss nobody, just facts. Like, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to give it to you to read. Read this. This is important. You know, family, kids pick up what you, anyway. But you, yeah, you know. But they believe that the followers of Jesus believe something happened, and they did what people do when something miraculous happened. They saw a person who they saw crucified, buried, They knew that he was dead, and now he is alive with them having breakfast. They did what any of us would do. Well, well now we would take pictures and video and post. But they just began to talk about it. And they began to talk about it. And they began to talk about it. And they began to write about it. They began to document 
what they saw. So consequently, we believe Jesus rose from the dead, not just because the Bible says, and just is important, not just because the Bible says, because, the, because if the, the, the Bible documents something that happened, right, it had they not documented it, it would have still would have happened. Can I get in? Come on, fam. You hear what I'm saying? A birth certificate kit doesn't determine whether you're alive or not. It just documents the fact that at one point you were born. So if you lost your birth certificate or it was destroyed or it wasn't accurate, it doesn't change the fact that you happened. Okay, okay. So similarly, the Bible doesn't make the Easter story narrative happen. It just documents that it happened. That's it. It documents. It's in here that it happened. We believe the, that Jesus rose from the dead because there was eyewitnesses that decided to write about it. People like Matthew, people like Mark, people like Luke, like John, like Peter, like John, the half-brother of Jesus. What would it take for your half-brother to believe that you were the son of the living God? What would it take for you to believe that your brother is God? It would take a miracle. And we don't see John anywhere. I'm sorry, we don't see James anywhere in the narrative until after Jesus comes from the dead. Then he's like, oh, okay, so I'm in now. And he became a leader of the church. Not when he was growing up, no, he was 13. Not when he was getting beat by everything Jesus did. Can you imagine? Jesus didn't lose. I, I, I can't imagine Jesus lost that basketball or checkers or chess or nothing. You know, well, maybe he did. Who knows? How about Paul who used to be a persecutor of Christians and then had an experience with Jesus and then became the primary person to uh, take the gospel or the good news to people like you and me? That's I will, I will point you to a resurrection. I will point you to an event that we celebrate today. So you have to do something. Look at me. If you forget everything else I say, you got to do something. You have to respond in some way with what happened on the cross. One or two things you could do. You could ignore it. And by ignoring it, you're making a decision. By ignoring the fact that it happened, you're making a decision. By ignoring it, you're making an assumption that it's either not real or not worth your time. And it's just an assumption. You know what happens when you make an assumption. So it's nothing, nothing else that I can share with you, fam, except who is Jesus and what are you going to do with him? That's something we all have to answer. No matter how old we are, no matter what life, no matter what you think you know about the Bible. Because the majority of us will say, okay, Hob, I grew up with this, I know about this. But you've never read the Bible cover to cover. If I asked you to explain your faith using New Testament, it would be difficult for you. If I asked you to lead me to Jesus using only the book of Romans, you'd be like, huh? Right? You, you try to pick a verse and you try to tell me, but I know and this is I know about God. And your picture is the wrong picture. Because it's a secondhand picture. Like somebody gave you the picture. It's like secondhand smoke. Somebody gave you your faith. There's a difference between somebody giving you your faith and then you, and then you birthing your faith. And that's what I want all of us to be. I don't want you to be dependent on me. I'm a flawed human being, fam. I will let you down. Be with me long enough, you'll be disappointed. And those of you who are close to me, be like, we got to give them a lot of grace. Man, we have a, we, we have a saying that we say with our leadership. It's called grace on tap. Thank you, Pastor Joanne, for inventing that little saying. Grace on tap. And we have to apply it. I have to have grace on tap. And Helena has to have grace on tap because we're just flawed. So if you depend on your relationship with Jesus because of me, then you're hanging it on the wrong thing. It has to be founded on an event. Because whether I come or I go, it doesn't matter. The event happened. <coughs> if the resurrection of Jesus is true, then it's game on for everything he said. Think about it. If the resurrection of Jesus is true, then it's game on for everything he said about himself and who he was. It validates everything he said about himself. But if it's not true, then we're just wasting our time and you just dressed up, looked pretty, worked hard this morning to set everything up, and then you can go out to lunch and we just wasted our time. But what if it happened? You're going to have to wrestle that to the ground. So on Good Friday, when Jesus was crucified, when Jesus died, hope died. When Jesus died, nobody believed that he was the son of God. Nobody believed that he was the Messiah. Nobody believed that he was the savior of the world. Even the people that rolled with him for three years, nobody believed. The moment that he died, everybody thought it was game over. They thought it was, there was nobody at the tomb on Easter Sunday counting down because they knew he was going to come back to life. Nobody. Nobody's doing 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
Nope. No follower. Everybody unfollowed. Only a brokenhearted mother and fear-filled disciples, but no followers of Jesus. But aren't you glad that it didn't end there? <laughs> it didn't end there, fam. Matthew 28, 1 through 6, follow with me. The day after the Sabbath day was the first day of the week. And at dawn on the first day, Mary Magdalene and another woman named Mary. I don't know why so many Marys. It's like a John, I guess. I'm sorry, John. Your, your name is special. You know what I'm saying? Verse 2. At the time, there was a strong earthquake, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and went to the tomb and rolled the stone away from the entrance. Then he sat on the stone. Verse 3, he was shining as bright as light, and his clothes were as white as snow. The soldiers guarding the tomb shook with fear because of the angel, and they became like dead men. Verse 5, the angel said to the woman, don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who's been crucified. He's not here. He has risen from the dead, as he said that he would. So Jesus said, he predicted that this would happen. Like, <laughs> I think we don't think about this enough, okay. But this man predicted everything that would happen. Not only this man predicted that every, or foretold everything that would happen to him. The old, the, the, the bigger part of your Bible, the Jewish scripture, right, the, the Old Testament, all points to the fact that Jesus, or what was going to happen. <laughs> Luke recorded Jesus' prediction in Luke 18, he says, Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, look, look we're going to go up to Jerusalem. And everything that has been written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on Don't let that pass you by, fam. Last night, last night we watched, uh, we do it every year. We watch a portion with our kids, right. And we watch this portion through the Jesus film. It's powerful. You should never let that become commonplace. The image. What happened. We could become callous and numb and move around. Uh, let me be honest. Angelina was like, hey, babe, today we got to watch the thing. And I was like, oh, man, okay. And for that second, whatever I was feeling was more important than what we were going to do with our children about Jesus. The one I'm going to preach about today. In a moment, I caught my attitude. And then we were doing little eggs with the kids and Eliana decide, I'm going to read the whole thing. So there goes an hour. <laughs> and Angelina was, Angelina was like, well, let me read some. And she's like, no, 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 I got it. <laughs> so then, you know, we, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. But I ain't going to lie to you. My flesh was like. <laughs> because that's how we are. That's how we are. We, <laughs> we are so pressed. We are so pulled in every direction that to sit. With the narrative, the story of our Savior, there's other things that I'm like, really, what was, more, what was I going to do? I'll tell you what I was going to do. I was going to go upstairs, get on my phone, look at reels. That's what I was going to do. <laughs> there was nothing more important. What did I have to do? Yeah, I had already prepped. The, the message was done. I came home. I, nothing. I was going to rest. I was like, babe, I'm tired of being out about. I just want to rest. She's like, yeah, well, we got to do resurrection eggs. Oh, praise the Lord. By the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. This is Jesus talking about what was going to happen to him. That's pretty dope. If someone predicts their own death, death <laughs> burial, resurrection, pulls it off, you should trust what they say. And Jesus made some outrageous claims about himself that you have to wrestle with. You can ignore them. That's your choice, but you're making a choice. You can know them in theory, but never let it affect your Monday through Saturday. You could read them and never, never touch your marriage or your kids. You could read these things and know these things and it never affect anything, the way you do anything in life. Or you can let them shape your life and go from being an admirer to being a follower because that's all being a follower is. You're following the teachings of Jesus, you're looking at what scripture says and you have made a conscious decision that I'm going to be a doer of God's word, not just a hearer. Because the secret sauce of the Christian faith is in the application, fam. <laughs> I'm going to say it to this side. Oh my gosh. 
the secret sauce of the Christian faith, you're like, ha, okay, been a Christian, I'm trying to get my marriage or relationship right, I'm trying to do the right thing, I'm reading the Bible, I'm going to church, I'm trying to listen to the good music instead of the bad music, I'm trying to do all the things, I'm wearing the t-shirt, ha, I'm doing it for real, for real. Okay. But when it's time to forgive, do you forgive? Or do you hold on to it and wait for the other person to forgive? First, come say they sorry. That's not what the Bible teaches. <laughs> okay. So the, the secret sauce, you're going to get the fruit when you apply the teachings of Jesus. You can believe and not apply. And he's going to be a well-informed admirer. Somebody needs to tweet that. A well-informed admirer. That's all you will be for the rest of your life. A well-informed admirer that wants it for their kids but not for themselves. A well-informed admirer that if somebody says something about the Bible, could be able to tell you what they know and feel real good because they was brought up in church and they could quote what the pastor said. But they don't even know if it's really in the Bible because they never saw it in the Bible. Or they read that one thing or heard that one quote and now it's rocking their world. <laughs> you know not everything that you see on a reel is accurate. I'll talk to this side. No, just because, just, no, no, just because some of you, no, no, just, I, listen, I love you. We're, we're family here today. We're, listen, this is, a lot of you are anxious, afraid, questioning your faith, uh, everything but in peace because you are believing some fake information or inaccurate information from somebody who received their information <laughs> secondhand. That's why I'm telling you that this faith has to be about you. It can't be about your kids or your mama. It's got to be about you. How are you going to interact with your girlfriend? How are you going to interact with your boyfriend? How are you going to pursue that marriage? What is going to be allowed before we get married? What, what are we going to, because, because we want God to bless our lives, but we're not willing to do it his way. It's just disingenuous and counterintuitive. Well, maybe it is intuitive. It's not counterintuitive. It's just we're deceived. Believing that we could do it one way. I'll put it this way. We're, we're deceived to believe that we can sow lies, that we can sow distrust, that we can sow rebellion, sow like a, a gardener sow seeds, and believe that we are going to come on this side and reap blessing and reap peace and reap joy. Like, fam, what you sow, you will reap. Later and greater is how it goes. Some of you are wondering why you're living in the situation you're living. It's not because God is mad at you. It's just because you are reaping the seeds that you sow. It had nothing to do with God. You sowed them, now you're reaping them. It's just life. But we look to God and we point the finger and say, you didn't and you said. Wait, wait, wait. God could be like, wait a minute. You decided to sow the seed. That's hard to hear. Fam, I know. I know. Okay, here we go. Let's continue. But Jesus said a bunch of things about himself that you have to wrestle with. I'm just going to give you seven, and I'm going to read them fast. I ain't going to explain them. Okay, you can watch this later. Number one, he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never go hungry, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He who follows me, who does what? Okay, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's powerful. And he says this, I am the door of the sheep. You're the sheep. I'm the sheep. It's hard to say for a Puerto Rican. But I, I am the door. <laughs> oh, and he says, all who have ever come before me are thieves and robbers. That's what the Bible says. But the sheep did not hear them. That's powerful. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Man, that's powerful. The only way to get into God's sheepfold or family or dwelling is to go through Jesus, which is the door. <laughs> like I know we want other doors in other ways, but there's no other way or door other than the door of who Jesus is. And I could, and I could preach that to you all day. Okay. Next one. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. And I know my sheep. And my sheep, and they know me and know what does it say? And I'm known by my own. Then he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. 
John said it too, and he said, and he quoted him too. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus asked, do you believe this? That's powerful. Do you believe this? Then this one, how about this one? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Stop. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to pause at this one. I got one more to go. I said seven, that's six. Listen, this is careful. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, fam. And no one goes to the Father except to me. I know that that's not the picture of God that you want in your house. I know you much rather have the picture that's not as accurate. Because Jesus is reiterating that not all roads lead to heaven. He's reiterating that not all paths or all religions lead to God. That is a deception. That is a wrong picture. You're living with the wrong pictures. Well, you know, the Muslims and the Buddhists and the, they, they all were the same God. No, different God, fam. And why is that important? Because you shall have no other gods before me. Jesus is the only way to forgiveness. Jesus is the only source of truth. Jesus is true knowledge about God because he says when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus is the only route to eternal life. And this statement that has lost significance to those of his day who were trying to gain access to God through keeping commandments and laws. We're still doing that today. You're doing that today. Some of you in some way believe that coming today made you earn some brownie points with the Lord. But you got all the brownie points already. All of them. As many brownie points as you're going to get, you got them. Jesus already paid the price for you. But it's significant today as many of us still attempt to do the same. We are surrounded by different beliefs and religions claiming, claiming to have access to God, a way to eternal life apart from Jesus. I know, I know. We would rather have that picture up in our home other than the accurate picture of who God is. But, but fam, I wouldn't be a good person or pastor or friend or family member to you if I didn't tell you what I know to be true. I know you rather Jesus be more palpable or acceptable or tolerant because that seems to be the image that the world, because tolerance equals love somehow. Okay. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him. Abides. Come on now, we got to talk about abiding, staying. All right. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. By abiding in family, or dwelling with, or attaching ourselves to Christ, we enable his life to flow like a branch who is attached to the, to the vine. Like apart from him, you can do nothing. Watch this. So let me, let me show you something. So on Sunday morning, on a Sunday morning, you come and you surgically attach yourself to the vine. You get in your car and you say, F this, and you cut it off, and then you go live your life. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say F this, but it's just who I am. Whatever. At least I didn't say the word here with y'all today. <laughs> and then you go Monday through Saturday unattached. Well, Pastor, I thought about him. That's good. That's, hey, that's a start. Hey, baby step. Thank you, Jesus, that you were thinking about. Yes, Lord. Thank you that you thought about him. That's good. But that's different than abiding, remaining, being saturated with two different things. Because you can't. <laughs> You can't be disattached from him Monday through Saturday. Come on Sunday, try to reattach. And you're never going to grow that way. The fruit is never going to show itself. And I'm not trying to judge you, family. Listen, this is a very common experience to all of us. So if you feel like I'm singling you out, I'm not. I'm talking to every single person. Every single person would raise your hand if this is hitting you. Just raise your hand and be honest to the rest of the people here. Thank you. It's everybody. It's all of us. It's all of us. So don't feel like, oh, he, he talked about me. He looked at me. When he looked that way, he looked, no. I love you. I like, what the heck? Okay. But in this metaphor, Jesus is the gardener in him and in his nurturing and tending and pruning. You can grow and all the potential that God placed inside you will come to pass. But you got to be connected, attached. You got to abide in. So here's some application, right? Here's some implication. Because of the resurrection, you could pray knowing that God hears your prayers. 
You can live knowing that there's life beyond this life. You can sacrifice knowing your faithfulness matters to God. Because it was Jesus who taught us to address God as Abba, which means Father. You know, it's a relational. He's your daddy. It was Jesus who taught us that he hears our prayers and even knows what we're going to pray before, he even, before we even say anything. It was Jesus who said that he's going to the Father to prepare a place. So if somebody predicts their own death, burial, resurrection, and pulls it off, you should listen to the claims he made about himself. You don't have to wrestle with that. Is this true? Or this is my mama's faith or my daddy's faith. It was Jesus who said over and over that what we do for others in this world or on behalf of him matters. So that's why we give. That's why we uh, serve. That's why we love. That's why we do for others. Because God said that what we do on his behalf matters. If you give even a little one a cup of water in my name. So you know that verb. I mean, not go there. I'm going to be nice. It was Jesus who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do you think <laughs> that God answered Jesus' prayer? Wait a minute, Jesus and the Father are two different people? I'm not going to explain that to you today, fam. you got to come to church. It was Jesus who, says, who said, it is finished. Now, is it finished or is it still going? Your eternity is finished. Like, it's, it's settled. You just have to receive it. And I hope that you do. So if you've never, Quincy, if you would, wherever you are, if you would, please, if you've never put your faith in Jesus... You should consider putting your trust and faith in Jesus. You should really consider it. The issue isn't, are Christians perfect? We've established that we are not. So don't say, I'm not, I'm not going to put my faith in Jesus because other Jesus followers are idiots. Right? We all are. Or the question is, is the church perfect? No, we've established that the church is not perfect. I'm your pastor. We've established that. The issue you have to wrestle to the ground every single day of your life for the rest of your life is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And what am I going to do about it? On Easter, that question was settled. And the answer is he's exactly who he claimed to be. He is a Savior and Lord worthy of your consideration and worthy of a response. So I'm going to ask you a question before we leave. If you are here today and you consider yourself a Christian, something you would say about yourself. Why should anyone outside the faith take our faith and the teachings of Jesus, of Jesus seriously if we don't? At the center of the Christian experience is a daily decision to submit to the king. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to be done. Luke 9. Then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple or my follower, my pupil, my learner, must deny themselves. So you're gonna have, it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to say no to you. Just put it out there in front, right, so you know what's there. And take up their cross. The people at the time knew what it meant to take up their cross. And then it says what? How often do you take up your cross? Come on, it's highlighted in yellow. How often do you take up your cross? Not just on Sunday, fam. Not just on Easter or Christmas. When? Daily when you go home, when you go to school, when you go to work, when you interact with your husband, your children, your spouse, your co-workers. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. So are you an admirer or are you a follower of Jesus is my question today. If not, who are you following? What are you going to follow? Who's going to rule you? Who is going to be the one you take your cues from? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be your appetites? Your ambitions? What you think needs to happen because you know so much? We all have the decision to make. Again, are you an admirer or a follower? Jesus invited all of us to make a decision today. So listen, I'm not going to ask you right now, have you ever given your life to Christ or you want to? I'm going to let you make that decision on your own. I'm going to ask you to stand into your feet because we're going to pray. And then after I pray, I'm going to pray for all of us and for you specifically. And then we're going to do communion together. You can stand to your feet. Stretch out a little bit. We're almost done. Fam, I only went over two minutes on Easter. Praise the Lord. 
Okay, listen to me. Because this is, this is important. This is important. About the most important thing we, we ever do. Would you put your hand on your heart right where you are? Close your eyes. You know it's okay to cry in God's presence, right? It's okay to feel remorse. It's okay to feel gratitude and it bubble up that way. It's okay to feel God's hand on you, telling you, try again, and you respond to that. He's not holding your sins against you. <laughs> He's just waiting for you to come home. He's not mad at you or angry at you. He's just waiting. So in your own words, would you tell God how it is that you feel? What it is that you want? I can lead you through a prayer, but then they would be my words. And these need to be your words. Come on, just a couple moments. Come on, tell God something genuine. You put him in the back burner, so have that conversation with him. You put other things before him, have that conversation with him. It's been the faith of your parents, have that conversation with him. You sowed bad seed, have that conversation with him. You've never put your faith because you've had a bunch of excuses that I said, that I mentioned today. Have that conversation with him. Thank you, God. If you're in this place this morning and you would like me to pray for you, I'm not going to ask you to come, but just lift up your hand and I'm going to pray for you. Anybody here that wants me to pray for them or the people around, amen, amen, amen. Receive this prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who have raised their hands, who, who are putting their trust in you, who are wanting to shift their attention to you in a more real and practical way. Those who want to experience your abundance of life and blessing. Those who have today decided to put their faith in Jesus for the first time or recommit their lives to you, God, I pray your grace be upon them. Continue your work in them, God. For we know that you're all the while working. We thank you for your faithfulness in their lives. We accept you in our hearts and our lives, Lord. Be ruler, have your way. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Okay, fam, we're getting ready to have communion. So if you would have a seat, now Helena's going to lead us through this time. What a good word, right? What a good word for the day, for the season. Definitely was ministering to my heart. Right now we have some communion cups being passed around, so feel free to grab one. Um, well, you know, one of the things that we say here at Proximity Church is that we want you to come and discover love, community, and purpose. And that doesn't mean when you walk in the door, it's like, ah, oh, love. I feel community. I feel the purpose, right? It's definitely a journey, and that is what God has called us to do. We've been, even the disciples were called to journey with him for three years. And we're called to go on a journey, and it's never always fun to go on a journey, but that's what we're on. And I think that every step of our journey and our faith is perfect timing. So maybe this will be a perfect timing for you in this moment where God's meeting you where you're at. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but in my home, I saw my mom do this, and I did this too for so many years, probably still do it, is I feed everyone first, I serve all my kids, I make sure my husband's sitting down, and then somewhere in the, there I get really hangry, and I get a cold plate of food after everyone's up, and I enjoy my cold food with scours, you know, I'm like, I hate this, right? I don't even get to enjoy the food that I just sat, like, stood up and for hours making. 
And sometimes we can get like that. And I went, I bring that into my spiritual walk. I remember the Lord convicting me that so many times I can bring other people to the table, but I myself will take a cold plate and not even enjoy his presence. It's like I just eat to receive, but not really to enjoy. So 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 today I want you to come and I want you to know that your little portion is served for you and that we're coming to the table. He already has your nameplate. He wants you there. He sees your name. He sees how he created you and he's making you whole in this moment and the word that god gave me was just come to the table that that's what and i remember have you doing a sermon many years ago on come to the table and it was so convicting and it's not who comes to the table it's how we come to the table right it's how our hearts are postured so in this moment i want you to begin to let the lord just take some deep breaths let the lord fill you up with his presence his peace because how we come to the table really matters If you think back in the Bible, there were so many people that you would not think would sit with Jesus, right? You would think he'd be sitting with kings and queens and these rich people, but instead he sat with the tax collectors. He sat with the people that were sinful. He sat with people like the Pharisees, the people that were hypocrites. Those are the people that he brought to his table. And today it doesn't matter then if you're coming in empty, if you're coming in depleted, if you're coming in unseen, or if you're coming in on a high and in a victory, it doesn't matter. You're all welcome to the table. And in this moment, we're just children of God. That's it. That's all you're coming as. You're not coming in with your great successes that you could pat yourself on the back for or in the emptiness of who you are. You're just coming in as a child of God. So today, we're going to take this communion together with a heart posture of being able to say, God, I need you. We worship you. We thank you. And you have my name written on your heart thank you, Lord. as you were on the cross and sent your son to die on the cross. This meal, this is my last thing I want to say before we take it. This meal is not the end all. You're not going to walk out of this holier, worthier. Yeah. It's already been done, yeah. right? It's already been done. This is just a moment of stopping and remembering. Sometimes I have to picture, not my Jesus on the left right now, we have to try to picture the Jesus on the right, but just picturing Jesus and all that he went through for us. And that's why we do this in remembrance and that's what he asks us to do. So this is not an end all, but this is just an opportunity for us to take this and remember we're on a journey. So I'm gonna pull up some scripture. Thank you, Lord. We're gonna take this together. I'm reading from Matthew 26, verse 26. That's how I remember it. So if you ever need to find a quick communion, Matthew 26, 26 says, While they, which is his disciples, were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. Now, you don't have to break it, but I like to break mine in half and just remember the broken body of Jesus on the cross. We represent it with this wafer. And he says, take, eat, this is my body. So let's take and eat and remember all that Jesus did. Thank you, God. God, I thank you for your body that was given up for us. Not only your body, but your soul, your spirit, all that you were on earth, you you. gave up for us. We can picture you being flogged. We can see you beaten, put on a crown of thorns, being whipped, being nailed, being held up high, exposed with no clothes on your back. Just trying to push shame and and mocking of you. Yet you did that all for us. Thank Thank you for what you've done. Verse 27 says, then he took the cup And after giving thanks, which I'm going to give thanks and we'll take it, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. God, I thank you, Father, for your blood that was poured out for our sins. Thank you that we don't live by the law anymore, but we are saved by a new law, a new grace of you, Jesus, that died on the cross and rose again. God, so we take this cup and we drink in remembrance of you. Jake. 
God, I thank you, Father, for who you are. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace that's new every day. You're worthy in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Feel free to sit, stand, kneel as we do this last worship song.
Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and your love and your kindness for the sacrifice on the cross. But today, we thank you for your victory, for rising above death and taking your place as King of kings and Lord of lords. We say, let thy kingdom come and thy will be done. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. <laughs> Pastor Trav, join. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Chief, if you would stay for a couple more minutes. Ah, oh, praise God. I'm so grateful for this time together. Well, we want to thank you again if this was your first time and you chose to celebrate this Easter morning with us. Um, we also want to just invite you to stay connected beyond this Sunday. And so on the back of our uh, chairs, there's a QR code. And so if this was your first time, we would love for you to scan that and just share a few quick um, answers with your contact information so we can stay in touch with you. And we are also doing giveaways outside, right? Or did we finish them all? Okay, we do still have some giveaways for you guys. And so we like to use, yeah, we like to use Easter and anniversary as opportunities to update everyone's information. And so to be included in our giveaway, we would actually like everyone to scan this QR code uh, because we're going to pick our winner, our next giveaways, not with tickets, but from our QR code. So, so if, that, it's everybody. Everybody go ahead and pull out your, your yes. phones. This is a time to update the information, even if you've done it before. Yes. Just update the information, all the giveaway information, all that kind of stuff is going to be done through this. So if you don't fill this out, we'll not be in the giveaway. Very short. Doesn't take long. I just wanted to especially invite our first-time guests to do that uh, because we are going to notice who's on there for the first time. We want to make sure we are keeping you in, in contact of all the things we have going on. And as I mentioned before, we have a, a guest station as well that we would love to be able to meet you face-to-face -face by name and give you a gift for joining us today. I also uh, wanted to share with you kind of how we do giving here. We are a debt-free church, and all of what we're able to do is from everyone's corporate efforts and generosity. And so we have a few ways that you can give if in your heart you would like to do that or if as a spiritual discipline you like to set aside a percentage of your finances every month to support God's kingdom advancing. And so some of the ways you can do that is by texting the number on the screen. We also have an in-person station if you prefer cash or check. And we also have our website that you can go give online. Yes. I'm going to give you guys a couple more seconds listening to music to f finish that. QR code. I still see some people typing. Enjoy the beautiful keys in the background. Next week, you're going to want to come because we're starting a new series. Pastor Javi uh, is going to start us off and get into some good information and just continuing on diving in deep past this question that was provoked here today. Who is Jesus? What does that mean to you? What are you going to do with that information? And so... Here at Proximity, we, we tend to do things by series because we try to hit one point. We try to hit one thing about this, who is Jesus information, and we try to really go in deep over a series of three, four weeks, six weeks, whatever it may be, but really go in deep to truthfully understand what this means and then what's the application to come out of it. And so we're going to be starting that next week. Um, here in a minute, we're going to be going outside. Okay, so we're going to be uh, opening up these curtains right back here, and then everybody is going to head outside to those doors. Uh, we have the Easter egg hunt out there for the kiddos. Um, 
and and yeah, we're gonna start that process. And then we also have uh, some cookies out there for everybody to take. Amazing cookies. You're gonna want to try them. You're probably gonna be tempted to take a couple, few more. Don't okay. Make sure everybody gets some. Um, but we're gonna have all that stuff outside. And we're gonna have the giveaways outside. So make sure that you head out that way. If it is your first time here, I know we talked about it a little bit already, um, but we will have somebody at the station in the front um, just to get to know you a little bit more, to give you a gift. They'll be out there. Elizabeth, she, raise your hand. Elizabeth will be right back there. She's going to go out there right now for anybody that does have to leave in case you are, are going to be out or need to head out. But then she's also going to come back out here, enjoy time with everybody. And then she's going to go back over there when we're done with the Easter egg hunt. Um, that way she doesn't miss anybody. Make sure you get your gift. Pastor Trav, are they going to give instructions outside on when the kids can start running out there and yes. grabbing all their yes, eggs? Yes. And if it's yes. elementary, for preschool okay, yes. first, and then elementary. Yes, yes. Okay, good. If we you need, need instructions. to choke hold your child, choke hold your child, and hold them back, okay? Because I know that they're going to be trying to go out there and get those eggs. Just hold up for like a minute until they give those instructions okay and make sure to get your kids right away so yes. i know we like to mingle and talk let's mingle outside grab all the kids so we can start as soon as possible yep get your kids and that's where we'll hang out for a few minutes um after the egg hunt i know that we have a lot of people that are servant-hearted and they love to help tear down immediately after service we're going to put a pause on all of that so that way everybody can enjoy time with one another out there. Enjoy the kids running, get your giveaways, all that kind of stuff. So don't touch any teardown. We're going to do that out there for about 20, 30 minutes. And then we're going to come in and tear down as a group. Okay. But without further ado, if you guys go ahead and stand up, pray you guys out. I thought about a dangerous prayer to ask yourself this week. Pastor Javi uh, really posed us with that question of who is Jesus. So I give you a dangerous prayer as you wrestle that to the ground. God, in what areas and in what ways have I deceived myself on who your son Jesus Christ is? Where have I lied to myself? And may that be the beginning of a conversation between you and your Father, your Heavenly Father, your perfect Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Enjoy the time outside with each other. Go get your kids. And see you next week. Don't leave your kids. I got enough of my own. <laughs>